Hello, today we're going to talk about Mendel, Gregor Mendel. Gregor Mendel was an Austrian monk who taught at the Brunn Modern School starting in 1853, and he started breeding peas in 1857. Okay, why did he do that? Well, in the monastery, they only could, everybody had a job. And part of his job, everyone had a job, and his job was to run the gardens. Well, after running the gardens for several years, you get, oh, you get a little crazy. And you start, I don't know what he started, but he started doing things kind of weird. Well, he noticed that in pea plants, that there were some strange things going on. Some of the peas were green and round and some were green and wrinkly and some were yellow and some were green and some had purple flowers and some had white flowers and some had nice smooth pea pods and some were wrinkly and some were yellow and green and tall and short and on and on and on. So he found all these things out about peas and he noticed them and he, he started wondering why those things happened and so he started um, doing some experiments on pea plants. And literally what he would do is he would cover up the, the flowers of the pea plant after he himself pollinated them so that bees couldn't pollinate them. And he knew who the father was. He knew where, what pollen the father pollen plant came from. And so he knew what characteristics created what. And so he started comparing them over the next several years. He did this, and he would collect all the peas at the end of the season and count how many of these he had and how many of these he had and so on and so forth, and he kept meticulous records. So he was honestly a little bit crazy, but that's what Gregor Mendel did. And then afterwards, he published some of the information that he found. And because of what he published and um, the information he discovered, he is given the title as a father of modern genetics because from him, from his ideas, all of the, the types of information, homozygous and heterozygous and dominant and recessive and all of those terms and the basic understanding of how genes pass come from Gregor Mendel. Now, he didn't know about DNA and he didn't know about genes, but he knew there was something there that was causing this to happen. And so he is given the credit for this discovery. Okay, so here again are some of the things that he found. Um, some of the different colors and where the buds are and tall and short and stuff like that. Okay. Geneticists use the term character for a feature like flower color, yellow or white or green or purple or whatever. And um, the term trait for any variant of the color. So white and purple are traits. The character is the color. He started his experiments by using true breeding plants. So what he did is over several years he would take a short plant and breed it with a short plant until 100% of the offspring were short. And then he used those seeds to then do experiments on. So that's 100% true breeding. He self-pollinated them. He knew you know, that those were only going to give you 100% of short plants. And then he started taking, let's say, a true breeding short plant crossed with a true breeding tall plant. And he looked at the ratio of offspring, how many were short and how many were tall, and tried to figure out what was going on. Now, some of the terms that he used and that we still use, the P generation is the parental generation. The F1 generation will be the, the first generation kids, and F2 is the second generation kids, kind of like grandkids. F stands for Latin. It's it's the term filial, um, which means offspring in Latin. So he took true breeding purple crossed with true breeding white. Purple, we now know, has two dominant purple alleles. The white has two recessive white alleles, little peas. You cross those, and in your F1 generation, you're going to have heterozygous offspring. And 100% of the offspring are heterozygous, and 100% of them are purple. He then crossed the purple flowers with purple flowers, put those together, and you get 
this F2 generation where it's a 3 to 1 ratio. 3 purple to 1 white. And from doing experiments like that, he came up with several findings. So let's talk about those. First of all, he figured out that there are alternate versions of genes that account for the variations. Now, he didn't know the term genes, he didn't know about DNA, but that's what he found, that there's alternate genes. Each character in an organism inherits two alleles, one from each parent. So each parent donates one of the P's, like that last example. If the two alleles differ, then one of them is dominant over the other. Now, this is mostly true. We will get into some codominance and incomplete dominance later on. But as far as Mendel was concerned, this was true. Um, and then he said during meiosis, the two alleles will segregate independently. So let's talk about what segregation means. What segregation means is that you have two alleles, one on each of your two different chromosomes. Same chromosome, you have two copies, one from your mom, one from your dad. In the process of creating sperm and eggs, these will separate into different sperms and eggs. Okay, so you're going to create, this is a guy, so he will create sperm. He creates four different types of sperm, two with big A's, two with little A's. Same with mom. And then you have a one in four chance, depending on who donates what. You can see what type of offspring you have. Law of independent assortment <clears throat> is a law that says not only do the alleles separate independently, but that it, the chromosomes separate independently also. So if you've got 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs, independent of each other, you could get a different combination of some from your mom, some from your dad, all mixed up in all the different types of eggs or sperm that you create. That's the law of independent assortment. Okay, so here's two different chromosomes and how you end up with what you end up with is independent of each other. What type of blue chromosomes you get is independent of what type of yellow ones you get. So some of the terms that Gringer Mendel coined, genotype, phenotype, homozygous, and heterozygous. Genotype is the actual genes that the organism has, like big R, little r. Phenotype is the appearance, blue eyes, dimples, having a widow's peak. Homozygous means you have two of the same genes, either two um, Recessive genes are two dominant genes. Heterozygous means you have one of each type. A monohybrid is when you look at one single trait, one single gene, and you create a Punnett square. If you're doing a double Punnett square, it's called a dihybrid. And those, this is a picture of a dihybrid. Okay, so you're looking at two traits and how the types of offspring you can have looking at two traits. Let's look at two basic laws of probability. The first one is called the rule of multiplication. The rule of multiplication says that if you want two things to happen in that exact order, then you multiply the individual probabilities. So if I have, I want two, I have two children and I want um, two boys in a row, what's the probability of having two boys? Well, probability of a boy the first time is one half. Probability of a boy the second time is one half. Probability of having two boys is one half times one half or one fourth. The rule of addition says that if I want two things to happen, but I don't care that the order in which they happen is, then you add the individual probabilities. So let's do another one. Let's say I want one boy and one girl, but I don't care which comes first. So probability of a boy is one half, probability of a girl is one half. So probability of having a boy and then a girl is one quarter. Probability of having a girl is one half, probability of having a boy is one half probability of having a girl and then a boy is one quarter. So the probability of having one girl and one boy, but I don't care which order, you add those two individual probabilities and you get one half. Okay, so 
I'm never, ever, ever going to have you do a dihybrid for me. You're not going to do a double pun and square. Instead, you have to learn how to, to approach these problems using single Punnett squares because they're a lot faster to do. You don't have time to do a double Punnett square on a test. You have to figure out how to do these very quickly. So let's take a look. Here's a problem. In pea plants, T is dominant over short. So big T is dominant over little t. Yellows are dominant with a big Y over green, which is a little y. Let's say we have a cross that results in 296 tall yellow plants and 104 tall green plants. What were the parents' genotypes? So, first thing you need to do is figure out what genes each of these offspring, types of offspring, have. Okay, so they are tall and they are yellow. Okay, so what genes does a tall offspring half? Well, I know it's going to have a big T. Now, I don't know if they're homozygous or heterozygous, so it's a big T and then I don't know what. What about yellow? Same thing, it's a big Y and then I don't know. So I know that um, they are a big T something, big Y something. Let's look at the other one. The offspring, the other offspring are tall. 104 of them are tall. Okay, wait a minute. Tall. So 100% of these offspring, all 400 of them are tall. What does that tell you about one of the parents? 100% are tall. That means one of the parents has to be a big T, big T. Then let's look at yellow and green. Yellow is almost 300 compared to 100 green. That's a 3 to 1 ratio. What genes do you need to give you a 3 to 1 ratio? Go back to that Punnett square we had a little minute ago. It's back a little further, wasn't it? Okay. To get that 3 to 1 ratio, what genes did the parents have? They were heterozygous, big P, little p. Ah, so go back to that problem. And that tells you that the parents for the green-yellow trait have to be heterozygous. So I know one of the parents is big T, big T, big Y, little y, and the other one, doesn't matter what the T's are, but I do know that it's a T, T, and then a big Y, little y. So here are your possible offspring, or your possible parents for that offspring. Two individual Punnett squares, and yet you're able to figure it out. We're going to practice doing some more of those because that's kind of a, it's hard for me to do this without showing you on the board, making you talk it out. Now we know that mutations cause changes to the DNA. Okay, we know that. Um, when we're looking at offspring, when we're going to look at DNA and do Punnett squares and stuff like that, the wild type is the most common type in the offspring or in the wild population. So let's say if we're talking fruit flies, fruit flies almost always have red eyes. Occasionally you'll have a mutant variation which will give you white eyes or brown eyes or barred eyes. Okay, those are the mutant alleles, those are mutations. The wild type is the most common in the wild population. So, let's take a little look here at an example from your textbook. Multiple alleles. Multiple alleles are when you have more than two types of mutants in a population. Okay, or more than one mutant in the population. So, you know, it's unlike, um, unlike dimples and no dimples, which you have, you either have or you don't have. Multiple alleles, you can have different types of variations. Okay, so the wild type in a chinchilla population, or excuse me, in a rabbit population, is a dark gray. However, you can also have a lighter gray called a chinchilla gray, which is recessive, the Himalayan pigment, which is recessive, 
and you can have the albino population, which is also recessive. Okay, so there are four different, in this rabbit population, four different alleles that code for coat color. Another very common multiple allele example that they give is with human blood type. In human blood type, you either have blood type A, B, O, or AB. The reason is there are three alleles that code for your blood type, A, B, and O. You can have um, two B genes and be blood type B. You can have two A genes and be blood type A. You can have an A gene and an O gene, O is recessive, you have blood type A, a B gene and an O gene, be blood type B, two O genes and be blood type O, or, and this is another example of something called codominance, if you have one A gene and one B gene, then you're blood type AB. So in this case, it's not only multiple alleles, but something called codominance. So you can get multiple things going on here. The way they write this is with this capital I, which sometimes confuses kids. The I stands for immunoglobulin, which refers to blood. If you refer, refers to red blood cells. And the letter tells you what the protein is on the blood cell. Now what blood multiple or these blood types mean, literally, on the outside of your red blood cells, you have proteins that stick out. If you have blood type A, you have blood you have protein A sticking out. If you have blood type B, you have a B protein sticking out. If you have blood type O, you lack protein. So you don't have any, any allele protein on the outside of your blood cell. If you are blood type AB, you have both A and B sticking out there. Um, you've also heard of positive and negative. That's another protein. It's called a um, RH factor. It stands for Reese's monkey factor because they first found it in Reese's monkeys. That RH factor um, also is a protein that sticks out. If you are positive, you have the positive protein. If you are negative, you lack the protein. So a person who is, let's say, O negative, lacks all protein. They don't have the AB protein and they don't have the RH protein, so they don't have protein. The importance for this is like when you're to receive blood in a blood transfusion or something like that, the proteins have to match your proteins because your immune system is looking for foreign protein. So if you have blood type A, they're looking for A proteins. They don't care if there's no proteins, but if there's a B protein, then the white blood cells freak out and try and kill all your blood, and then you die. So that's not a good thing. But they don't care if there's no protein, just not the wrong protein. So being blood type O is, or receiving blood type O is the best because your body doesn't care. It's not foreign to it. So it's all kind of good. Let's go to another characteristic which Mendel did not talk about. It was incomplete dominance. This is not as clear cut because what happens with this one is you have um, a characteristic that blends. Neither trait, neither allele is fully recessive or fully dominant. And so they blend together. Now the example they always give is with a flower called um, a snapdragon. In the wild, you have red snapdragons and you have white snapdragons. But when you cross those, you get pink snapdragons because you know red and white paint make pink. And that's exactly what happens. They have a red, pro, a red gene and a white gene. Those blend, giving you the mixed trait. When you cross the pink flowers with more pink flowers, you get back the white and the red and the pink. So you get them all back. That's incomplete. It's not, red is not fully dominant over white, so you get a different ratio in the offspring. Codominance is when both are fully expressed, and the example again is blood type. Um, if a person is AB, they have the A protein and the B protein, and they have blood type AB, and both are fully expressed. They're not partially expressed, they are fully expressed. Let's go to another characteristic. This is called polygenic inheritance. Poly means many, genic means genes, give you your inheritance. That's, this is when many genes code for one trait. So a real good example would be human skin tone. Human skin tone is a combination of several genes that actually give you the color of your skin. 
So there are actually six of them, no, three of them. You get two of each type. The more dominance you have, the darker skin tone you have. The more recessive you have, the less dark your skin tone is. As you can see, though, humans have a range of skin tones. Okay, a range of skin tones. Because of that, um, not only is environment affecting that, because you know when you get in the sun, the sun, your skin tone gets darker. But this is like when you're not in the sun. In the wintertime, what color is your skin tone? So, polygenic. Many genes coding for one trait. The combination of the genes gives you your actual skin tone. Now, we don't have just six skin tones, like I said. Environment plays a huge role in the actual skin tone that you have. The more you're in the sun, the more melanin your skin is going to produce, the darker your skin tone is going to become. But it's still, it, it's still related to your gen genetics. How many melanocytes do you have that can code for freckles or for more melanin? So they're related together, but it is still the environment meant can impact your gene dramatically. We can also follow traits through families by looking at family trees. We're going to look at the royal family of England and how a trait for hemophilia passed down from Queen Victoria through many royal families in Europe. Hemophilia is a genetic disease that causes the person with the disease to bleed uncontrollably. They don't have clotting factor, and so small wounds can bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed. Bruises can cause internal bleeding that doesn't stop. It's carried on the X chromosome, so because it's on the X, the only way a girl can have it is if she got it from her father and her mother. It's not very common in girls, because most boys who have it don't survive to having to an age when they can have children. So it's not terribly common in girls. Much more so in boys because a boy only needs one X. They only have one X and if it's on their X chromosome they have the disease. So many boys you will find die from this disease. And as you can see most of the boys who have it actually die. Now here's one who didn't die but that would have been very rare. Okay, most of these boys are dead. The girls with a half circle are actually carriers of it and pass it on to their children. You can see how that passes through. Now, Queen Victoria had a whole bunch of, of children. She then married her children off to almost every royal family in Europe because kings and queens, princes and princesses, married other princesses and princesses. And so um, you're really only allowed to marry other royalty. And so these ki these children who were carriers were married into the royal families. Just by chance, here's the royal family in England. Here's um, Prince Charles right there. Um, not the person who married into, or who was the king, King Edward VII, did not carry the disease, and so it did not pass through the royal English family. But all the rest of the families in Europe kind of got screwed in the matter. They, they kind of got messed up because Queen Victoria was a carrier. It's just the way it is. Okay, so you can use a family tree to look at how a trait passes down, kind of like that. We're now going to look at several genetic diseases. You need to know a little bit about the diseases and how they're passed. Okay, so I'll point things out as we go along. Cystic fibrosis is an autosomal disease. That means it's carried on a regular chromosome. It's not on a sex chromosome. Okay, what happens with this disease is that it codes for a membrane protein that transports chlorine across the membrane. Because the chlorine is not processed the way it's supposed to be processed, the symptoms involved cause um, a very thick sticky mucus in the lungs and in the intestines and that mucus builds up collecting bacteria which causes lung infections, pneumonia, bronchitis which can kill them. They also have very severe digestive problems because the pancreatic ducts get plugged up with this mucus and they don't release the correct enzymes in the digestive system and so things get messed up. 
This used to be a fatal disease where children would die when they're like three or four years old. Currently, people with this disease are living into their low 30s, but it's not a very pleasant disease. It, it's very traumatic. The next one is Tay-Sachs. This is auto, also an autosomal recessive disease carried on a regular chromosome. It is recessive. It's caused by a dysfunctional enzyme that fails to break down lipids in the brain. Now, a lipid is a fat molecule that builds up in the brain. That fat builds up between the neurons, and it stops the, neur the neurons from being able to talk to each other. So, um, after a few months after birth, you have a very normal baby. And then after that, the baby starts with seizures and blindness and losing motor functions that they had. You know, they might have learned to crawl and sit up, and then they lose those functions. And the baby usually dies before they're three years old. I mean, you're born with a very normal baby. There's absolutely nothing wrong. But then the lipids start building up in the brain, and the stuff that the baby learned to do, they can't do anymore. And then they die. They turn into a vegetable and die. So that's a really... That's a terrible disease in my mind as a parent that because you have a normal baby, there's nothing wrong with them and there's nothing you can do. There's no treatment or anything like that. Sickle cell anemia is our next disease. This is an autosomal recessive disease that causes the beta hemoglobin molecules to be malformed. Now this is a point mutation in the beta hemoglobin molecule. So that molecule is not quite the right shape. When the oxygen levels in the body drop, it causes the hemoglobin to change shape, causing the red blood cells to change shape into this crescent moon shape instead of being nice and round. Well, these crescent moon shape things get caught in the capillaries, causing capillaries to rupture. And whatever, wherever that capillary is that ruptures, you get damage, whether it's in the brain, in the kidney, in the heart, in the skin, wherever the capillary is, you get damage. And it can lead to fatal results. Sickle cell anemia is, is evolutionarily related to another disease called malaria. Malaria is a parasite carried by a mosquito. It lives in the stomach of the mosquito. And when it gets inside your butt, body. The mosquito bites you, the parasite gets inside you. What it does is it attaches to hemoglobin molecules in your blood cells and causes the blood cells to rupture. So the person becomes anemic and can die. Okay, um, but a person can die from malaria. A person can also die from sickle cell anemia. But if the person is heterozygous for sickle cell anemia, so they, they don't have the recessive sickle cell disease, little less, little less, they're not homozygous dominant, they survive both. Malaria only attach, attacks red blood cells where both hemoglobin molecules, the alpha and beta proteins, are both correct. So if a person is heterozygous, they don't get malaria and they don't get sickle cell anemia. They survive both. So this evolved in Africa sometime thousands and thousands of years ago where someone had a genetic mutation, a point mutation on the hemoglobin molecule, and just by chance, they survived not getting malaria. However, you know, their kids could have sickle cell disease. And so it passed down um, through the, the families. And now in Africa, you find large portions of Africa where you have people with the sickle cell gene. The yellow is where the uh, malaria occurs, and the stripe is where you have people with sickle cell anemia. So you see a, a very large component of people in Africa can carry this disease. But they're immune to malaria, so it's, got, it's beneficial. That's why it, it evolved and survived in the population. The next disease is PKU, phenylketonuria. I can't pronounce it. It's an autosomal recessive disease that's caused from the inability to break down one of the 20 amino acids called phenylalanine. And it results, phenylalanine builds up in the body and it results in mental retardation and things like that. This one is actually survivable. What you do is you just have a diet very low in phenylalanine and you're fine. Now phenylalanine is found in pop and gum and, and stuff like that. Look on your um, food labels tonight. Look on your food labels and see if you can find 
one food that has label on the label, because it has to be there, phenylalanine. And then people who have this disease just know they can't eat that particular food. Let's see if we can make a list of food that people couldn't eat with this disease. Okay, so tonight that's your homework. Find one. Tell me. Look it up. Okay? All right. So let's look, look at some of the dominant diseases. Um, the first one, achondroplasia, is a form of dwarfism. There are several types of dwarfism. This is just the most common type. This is a person who has like a normal sized body torso, but their legs and arms are really short and their heads tend to be a little bit too big for the body size. So they're kind of out of proportion. That's this particular disease. Now, this disease, while dominant, occurs spontaneously. You can have two normal sized parents and have a dwarf. Okay? Because the it spontaneously can form in the dwarfs. However, if you are a dwarf, then you have a 50-50 chance of passing on this particular gene to your offspring. Another dominant disease is Huntington's disease. This is a I think it's kind of a really bad one. It's a degenerative nerve disease that results in paralysis and then death a couple of years after you start having symptoms. But you don't start having symptoms until you're in your late 30s, early 40s. By that time, you've already passed it on to your children because most people in their late 30s and early 40s have already had children. But your children have a 50-50 chance of having the disease if you have it. And so it, by the time you know you have it, it's a little too late to stop the spread of it. So I think that one's kind of a, a terrible one to have. The next several are going to be sex-linked diseases. These are diseases that are carried on the X chromosome. So they're more common in boys because boys only have one X chromosome. And so if it, the X chromosome has, this, has a disease on it, they have the disease. Okay, so it's called sex-linked. The first one I talked about already, hemophilia. Um, it, it's the inability to clot their blood. So if left untreated, they can bleed to death from various um, bruising and wounds. Another one is red-green color blindness. This is a sex-linked recessive disease that causes the inability to distinguish between red and green. Not fatal, not deadly. A person with this disease just can't fly an airplane because when landing, they use red and green lights, and you couldn't land the plane. So don't, don't be a pilot. The next one is called Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. This is a sex-linked disease, but it is dominant. Okay, so that's kind of a nasty. Um, this is, causes um, an absence in essential muscle protein, so you have muscle weakening and ultimately death. There are other types of genetic diseases besides the specific protein ones that we've talked about. Another type of disease that a person could have could be caused from non-disjunction. Non-disjunction is when in meiosis the chromosomes don't separate properly, so the sperm or egg will have 22 or 24 chromosomes instead of 23. So when they join with a sperm or egg, then you have too many chromosomes. You'll have 47 or 45. Depending on which chromosome you have extra or lacking will determine which disease you have. So this is what is supposed to happen in meiosis. You're supposed to have your normal chromosomes, and they're supposed to line up, and they're supposed to separate. And then in telophase 2, you're supposed to have one of each type. Okay. However, in um, non-disjunction, instead you could have the chromosomes being stuck together during meiosis 1, and so when they separate you get too many or too few. Or it can happen during meiosis 2 where the, the chromosome doesn't separate, not the tetrad up here. So the chromosome doesn't separate properly, so you can have too many or too few. So. That's non-disjunction. Let's look at some diseases caused by non-disjunction. One of the most common is Down syndrome. They have three number 21s. So you can see right here, 
three number 21s. Having three of them gives them all of the symptoms that a person with Down syndrome has. They have very similar facial features, kind of a little flatter, slanted eyes and large tongues and mental retardation. All of those are caused from having three number 21s. Another disease is called Turner syndrome. Turner syndrome um, occurs, is the only one I, disease I have that has 45 chromosomes instead of having 47. They're missing one, and the one they're missing is an X chromosome. So they have one X chromosome. They are always female. They're short. They have something called a webbed neck. They are obese and mentally retarded. Um, they're also sterile. Now, a webbed neck, I'm, I'm sure you're saying, what's that? Um, a webbed neck means, you know how a mes muscle builder can um, kind of flex and get the neck muscles to bulge out? on the sides of their neck going from the ears down to the shoulders. It looks like that all the time. So it's called a web neck. That's Turner's syndrome. Kleinfelter syndrome occurs only in males. And a person with Klein, uh, Kleinfelter syndrome has too many sex chromosomes. So they can be an XXY or an XXYY or an XYY. They just have too many sex chromosomes. Now, these guys have various symptoms, but they are always male, they are sterile, they typically have breasts, and are mentally retarded and tend to have higher levels of aggression than other people. Kleinfelters. The last disease we're going to talk about is one called cri de chat, which is French, which means cry of the cat. It's kind of a weird one. This is non-disjunction of the fifth chromosome and it's a deletion of one of the five chromosomes. So again, this one looks like it has, it's a deletion of part of chromosome five. It's not a full chromosome that's missing. So it's not exactly 45 chromosomes. But people with cri de chat have physical and mental retardation. And the most common thing, they're, when they're babies, they meow like a cat. I don't know, that's kind of weird. But that's where the name comes from. But they have a lot of physical and mental issues, and so hearing a baby cry like that throws a red flag up, and so then they'd be tested and find out what's wrong with them. But um, it's a non-disjunction, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about that. Okay, so that's it for the PowerPoint tonight. Your only homework tonight was back here where I had you look up something, which was, I forget what it was even. No, wasn't there, wasn't there. I'm sure it wasn't there.